Welcome. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. We want to thank you for attending our first annual Socktoberfest. Uh, we're bridging the strategies and techniques used in brewing great beer with that of creating a robust cybersecurity environment. My name is Steve Cobb. I'm the CISO for One Source Communications. We are a uh, managed service provider for offering managed IT services and managed security services to our clients around the globe. Um, today, I have with me two prominent guests who are going to discuss with us the brew world and give us some information around how they brew great beer. I've got uh, love to introduce Dano from a brewer from over Mad Mole Brewing and Martin, who's a partner at Mad Mole, both based out of Washington, North Carolina. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys and let you give a little bit of background about you both and uh, the information, uh, a little information about Mad Bell Brewing as well. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, my name is Martin. I am part owner of Mad Bell Brewing in Wilmington, North Carolina. We opened in April of 2018. So we've been open a little over three years. Um, this here is Dan O'Farrens. He's our head brewer. So he's responsible for making all the goodness. Yeah, so we're excited to talk to you about just the beer making process. Great. Well, it is a pleasure to have you all. We're excited about this being our first annual event. We want to have it a lot more, but uh, we thought this was the perfect time to marry Cybersecurity Awareness Month and Oktoberfest, and let's merge those things together. And there's going to be a lot of people, in fact, ask questions for people saying, what does security have to do with beer? Well, just hold on. We're going to tell you. We'll walk through it. And, and the two may not be uh, synonymous, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of similar similarities between the process that goes through making great beer, the process that you need to go through to have a great cybersecurity program. So as we start off and kick off, Oktoberfest may have been canceled in Germany this year, but that's not going to stop us from celebrating Socktoberfest, which is what we're here to do today. Um, we know there's a lot that goes into brewing a great tasting beer. You have to have quality ingredients. You need to have avoid harmful additives. You need to be vigilant to keep everything clean and avoid compromising the brew. And so all these same principles apply to creating a top-notch cybersecurity team and environment and protecting your organization. So we're going to go down that road and talk about it a little bit today. We're going to be discussing the ingredients and the process needed to craft a great beer, a perfect beer, if you would, but also the key ingredients to brewing a robust cybersecurity environment and best protect and defend your organization. Now, this is an interactive event, so we welcome your questions. You can post your questions. You should have a little Q&A button there. And we'll get to uh, Q questions and answers in, near the uh, end of the session today. So whether it's about brewing beer or whether it's about brewing your cybersecurity environment, uh, we're open to all those questions. We'll be addressing those as we have time. So let's start off here real quick, Dan. I'm going to ask you or Martin, one of you to go through, uh, giving us that idea as we talked about ingredients, recipe, kind of uh, cleanliness, all those different aspects of brewing beer and cybersecurity. Give us kind of the basics around brewing beer and what you guys do there at Manmo Brewery. Yeah, so basically, like, we make beer, which is, um, <laughs> yeah, it's not, I mean, it's not like, uh, it basically, beer is kind of any fermented beverage that you can use from, like, a malt source, so that could be, like, what we normally do, which is barley and wheat, but you can also make beer using sorghum, corn, and other kind of ingredients, so there's two kind of main types of beer, um, there's ales and lagers, so ales are your top fermented beers and lagers are more of a bottom fermented. So an ale typically is gonna be like a pale ale, your IPA, stouts, porters. Um, they ferment at uh, warmer temperatures and they ferment a little bit quicker, usually two weeks to a month. Whereas your lagers ferment at the bottom, they ferment colder and they'll take anywhere from like two to three months to finish fermenting. So that's a Pilsner. Uh, a lot of your domestic lagers, anything like that takes a lot longer, but it's just that type of yeast. So kind of the main ingredients we typically use is the malt, which is your barley, uh, wheat, rye, and we'll kind of grind those up. And basically kind of depending on what type of malt we have, we can change up the type of beer. So like a stout, we're using, um, a stout we'll use, our normal malt with some of the roasted barley to kind of bring out that color. Uh, ambers are going to use a little bit more of the uh, caramel notes. And then the kind of the main important ingredient for us a lot of times is the water. So here in Wilmington, North Carolina, we just use our local city source water. Mm -hmm. uh, breweries, wherever you are, are going to use the local water. So you can kind of recreate 
that unique beer to that area based on the water profile that you have. Um, kind of everybody's favorite part though beer and the really cool part are the hops. So hops are added during a couple of different stages of the brewing process. During the boil, they're often at the beginning of the boil, they're added for bitters. Middle part of the boil towards the end, they're added for flavor. And then the very end of the boil or even add it to our fermenters that you can see behind us. Are all and then the last thing we kind of do is we use the different yeast strains. So lager versus ale yeast. So if we think about hops, and I think I heard you say this, Dano, but is hops what makes the flavor for the beer? So depending on what type of hops or all those other things, is that, is that the variant that really adds flavor to the beer? Yeah, so the hops are going to be part of it. Um, a lot of the flavor comes from the malt and the water and the yeast, but then you do have like your big fruity flavors kind of derived from uh, certain hops from like Oregon, or you can get more of like a spicy herbal peppery notes from hops from like Germany or earth tones and things like that from hops from the UK. So each kind of region of the world has their own hops. And depending on which hops you're using, you'll get different flavors in your beer. Are there local hops that you use in Wilmington, North Carolina? I mean, are there really. growers? Okay. Okay. No, it's too, it's too humid here. So the hops uh, don't. Gotcha. Well, there's some out in the mountains on the western part of the state. Sure, yeah. That area, but most hops we have to import from other parts. And so if we think about our typical American beer, right, which you, I'm not going to mention any names here, but when you go to the grocery store and they have all these different beers that you can get there, those are typically Pilsner beers. Is that right? Is that what the majority of those? Yeah, log, American lagers or um, Pilsners, um, depending on which company and which brand. Now, I understand just from doing some research for Oktoberfest that the Germans are pretty particular about their beer and their brew, right? They, they've got this thing. I'm going to get you to explain the difference, maybe culturally, culturally difference between um, Reichenspot versus American. And I probably messed up that, that term there. But tell us just real quickly about those differences and culturally how, how we look at it differently maybe than, the, than German people do or other cultures even. Yeah, so the Reichenspot right, is kind of the German purity laws. And basically, they just say, like, you can only add water, malt, hops, yeast to a beer. Whereas here in the U.S., like, there's no purity law. So, like, you have breweries, like, we'll put fruit in beers. Um, mm -hmm. Breweries will throw, like, cakes, pies, all sorts of things. Just throw them into the mash, let them ferment. Um a little while ago, we did a pretzel pilsner, which was a lot of fun. We're there, we took a local pretzel shop, a bunch of his stale pretzels, and threw them in a beer. So it's just kind of here you get away with playing right. things like that. Whereas there, they're very much, there is beer and it's made this way. Yeah. And let me say, too, we've got some people that are making some comments in chat from people from all around the U.S. I saw Vegas and Grand Rapids, a bunch of people. Love to hear that. Please uh, post your questions if you have, post comments on the chat. We want to make this interactive as possible. And being it's interactive, I want to take real quick before I talk about the ingredients, kind of a Visiva security recipe or those things that you put together and talk about the environments you, you both, you all are in and, and we're in. I'll let you go first. You're in your brewery, correct? And I understand yeah, yeah. behind you all are, are fermenters, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So That's we'll correct. go through that process in a minute of your process to brewing, but I'm, the fermenters, I'm assuming, play a pretty um, important role into the brewing of the beer overall. Um, yeah. I am located in a, one of our security operations centers. So one, one source communication has two security operations centers, one on our East Coast, one on the West Coast. I'm on the East Coast and our East Coast uh, sock is actually located in a bank vault. So you can see behind me, this is the bank vault door into the vault. We've got security analysts that work within this area in the vault and outside of the vault. So we really can talk about our security operations are really secure because we operate out of a bank vault. So uh, pretty neat little uh, tour here. If you ever are in the area for Raleigh, North Carolina, let us know. We'd love to take you through a tour of our security operations center. When we think about the ingredients that you laid out, Dano, it does mimic a cybersecurity program uh, pretty interestingly because we have ingredients there. When we talk about ingredients for cybersecurity, there's a lot that goes in for a company to put together a great cybersecurity program to protect and defend. And that's one of the things OneSource does for our clients is to make sure we have these pieces in place. So you talked about water, malt, hops, and yeast. And in our ingredient structure, we think about people and expertise. So you got to have people that have the, the right skill set, know what they're doing. 
uh, and that can appropriately address the tools and the process that you have. The second thing is tools, right? Tools aren't going to do it all by themselves. You got to have the people that are monitoring the tools and look at that. But tools has a lot of, when you think about tools, you're thinking about um, the antiv traditional antivirus that's really not helpful anymore, but at EDRs and other tools that you put on your computers. Um, you know, a lot of people at home will be using some type of protection on their computers, but in business specifically, we want EDRs, EPPs, products that look at our endpoints, be it workstation servers, Linux boxes, whatever it is, and really look at behaviors and, and malware and other things that may get on those. As part of it as well as processes and procedures. So what do we do if we have an incident, right? What do we do if we have an alert? What's the process and procedure? I'm sure you all, I, I don't know, I'll ask you this, you all probably use standard operating procedures, SOPs, is that what you all use when you go through for your cleanings and brews and things like that? Yeah, constantly. They're yeah have to follow them always. Yeah, and so we've got some of the same things from a process and procedure perspective, and it's something we love to talk to our clients about and we try to impress upon them is, let's make sure policies and procedures in place, our internal SOC team that manages internally for one source and our clients have those you know, procedures that we go through when an incident happens, alert happens, who do we notify, what steps do we take, understanding what it is, whether or not criticality is and taking the process there. And then the last thing we wrap around is kind of the training piece. So making sure that our people are trained on those tools, they know how to operate them, they know uh, the latest uh, attacks that are coming out, what hackers are doing, that changes from day to day, uh, and how they operate or interact with those tools and processes. The training piece really ties all that together. So we talked about ingredients both for cybersecurity and for brewing beer, but what does it look like to actually brew the beer? So I've got this, you know, I'm imagining these big barrels, if you will, uh, Martin and Dan of yeast of hops of malt and of water what happens now so basically kind of the first step is to mill the malt so we have a grain cracker that we run our malt through and depending on the type of beer it's anywhere from 300 pounds all the way up to like 650 pounds and we'll grain that in and then we add it to our ma our mash tun so to my right here we have our boil kettle and then the doorway right in front there, that's our mash tun. So we'll add the grain to our mash tun. And basically what that is, is it's, basically, it's like a giant tea. So we have the grain in there. We'll add a bunch of hot water. And then we let it sit for an hour. And that just- Is that, so and tea. Is that, what is that consistency like? Is it like oatmeal or is it like much thinner um, than that? Watery oatmeal. Oh, yeah, okay. Watery oatmeal. And gotcha. so once that kind of sits for an hour, We'll move that, we'll take the water out, leaving the grain behind and move it to our boil kettle. And the purpose is we want to extract as much sugars as we can off of that grain. Yeah, so the longer you let it sit, kind of the more sugars you get, but after a certain point, it's diminishing returns. So once we move it into the boil kettle, we'll let it boil for 60 minutes or 90 minutes, depending on the type of base malt we're using. And then we can add our hops during that time. And after that 60 or 90 minute boil, we will take it from a boil and we'll cold crash the beer down to about 69 or 55 degrees. Um, and basically by dropping that temperature down, we're gonna try and bring it down as quickly as we can so that we can begin fermentation. So the whole brew day, like we brewed this morning, takes about six hours to eight hours. And really not that long. Once a beer enters the fermenters, they'll sit, they'll sit in there for a month, maybe more, just depending on the style of beer. And that's kind of where the waiting game comes. And it's a lot, a lot of the process of brewing is making sure everything's clean and ready just to make happy yeast. All we're doing is making an environment for yeast to thrive. And when the yeast thrives, we get a delicious beverage out of it. So once that's done, we drop the temperature, move it into a bright tank, carbonate it up, and then serve it to the people to enjoy. So you got the beer, then you add the carbonation to it, then that's the, the, the final product that you put out in taps yep. or kegs, wherever the case may be. Now, let me ask you about after the, after the fact. So once that's done and you put the carbonation on it, do you have to hold that as a specific temperature or something like that? Can it get hot? And then you get it back cold. I'm, I'm not a, a beer drinker now. I used to be back in my college so, days. And so I remember I remember hot beer and I remember cold beer. And I remember things changing, it seemed like, when the beer got hot. 
Yeah. So we try <laughs> once our beer, once we drop the temperature on our beer down to about 33 degrees, we try and keep it yeah. at 33 degrees until it's in somebody's belly. Cause <laughs> If you let a beer get hot and then cold and then hot, it'll start producing off flavors and kind of changes the dynamic of the beer. And so we really try and just keep our beer as cold as we can until it's into somebody's house and arms. So gotcha. Yeah. Any okay. beer you ever find packaged anywhere is always made cold, packaged cold, and transported. And then once it gets to a store, sometimes they just for storage space aren't able to keep it in a fridge. Yeah, but you know, you want to keep it, you don't want it to yeah. get really hot. Yeah, you want to yeah. keep that temperature down. Are there are there certain places or cultures that drink beer warm? I, I, it seems like I've, I've heard of people that drink a, a, yeah, maybe the, a the, beer or something. The legend is, is that the, the British drink their beer warm, you know, but I, I think it's like 50 degrees. Yeah, it's like 50 degrees. It's not you know, terribly warm. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. You know, a lukewarm beer would not taste great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, understand. Yeah. Um, well, as, as you went through that kind of recipe for, for brewing great beer, uh, we got the same kind of things that we do with our ingredients on the cybersecurity side. So the, the recipe for a great cybersecurity program or environment, we start out with that people with passion. That's important. People need to have a passion because as they're going up against uh, hackers and threat actors, they've got to understand what they're up against. They've got to be as good as the threat actors and hackers. And they got to know the tools they're using. Um, they got to be able to understand what is they should be suspicious of, what happens they should, they should be raising flags about. And then following those procedures, things that we talked about before, re having really strong expertise there. So as you look at that from what you're creating for a, a great brew, uh, that people and passion is one of the key elements, maybe the yeast, if you will, for us in a cybersecurity environment. That's the piece that really brings everything together. And then we talk about the tools, right? So they take those tools and implement those. They're a must. You have to have the tools. And we talked about a little bit about EDRs, network security, uh, multi-factor authentication tools. One thing I recommend for everybody to do, if you're not using multi-factor authentication, do it, do it now, do it as soon as you can. Uh, but then also other protections like threat intelligence, understanding uh, what attackers are doing so you can understand their, their techniques, their tactics, their procedures, and how they operate. All that working together so your tools are really giving you valid data. And then the documentation piece comes next. Once again, we talk to customers all the time about having an incident response plan and being ready for attack. The question is not these days. Uh, if you're going to get attacked, the question is when you're going to get attacked. So, so customers and, and environments, businesses need to be prepared for those attacks when they're coming and try to minimize that as much as possible. We talk to clients all, all the time, specifically on those narratives that let's be prepared when an attack comes, we can make it as least impactful as possible. And we can protect what we call crown jewels or those things that are really important to the organization so the attackers don't have access to that. And then the last piece is one of the most challenging pieces is training. So getting your people trained within your organization, it's a struggle for us at one source to make sure our folks are trained and staying as highly um, uh, skilled as possible, especially with all the new techniques, all the new uh, applications and org operating system changes that come out, but it's vital because just like as you go through that recipe, Dano, and you mentioned your, your, your SOPs that you have to uh, follow those and you follow those religiously each time you do things, our folks need to be trained on that as well. Because if taking missteps during the process of working on an incident or compromise can lead to even potentially hurting the environment worse than it was before. So training is one of those key aspects that we talk about when we talk about cybersecurity. Um, now let's say we're, we've, we've gotten the idea or we've finished the idea of, of brewing and, and, and the ingredients. Um, but you know, as we were talking about this before, Dana, one of the things you mentioned to me was kind of interesting when you said that um, how, how important cleanliness is to a brewery. Because uh, you know, for whatever reason, a lot of times when I think about brewing and brewery, I think about it, somebody doing in their basement, the garage, maybe there's not the cleanest environments, maybe uh, there's some uh, you know, rugged environments that may affect, but you know, what we were talking about, essentially, you've got, I won't say a clean room, but you, you're pretty hung up on making sure the area is clean and sanitized, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the old <laughs> is, is that brewing is 90% cleaning and 10% brewing. 
So 90% of the work that gets done around here is keeping everything clean. Um, that's pretty much what I do on a daily basis is like, we'll spend a little bit of time brewing two to 3% and then inventory, making sure everything's where it is. But the rest is keeping things clean. And it's not just like the inside of tanks. Like we clean the inside of tanks all the time. Uh, a beer goes out of it, one of our fermenters, then before the next beer goes in, we'll run caustic, we'll run acid, we'll break the whole, take every fitting off, scrub it with toothbrushes, make sure there's nothing from the last beer anywhere on there, put it all back together, and then we can put a new beer in. But like the outside of tanks need to be cleaned just because the floors get scrubbed on a weekly basis, uh, both where the bar is and in the back, back here where we make all the beer, because just a flake of dust or something could carry a bacteria and that bacteria the, the same really great wort and things that we put in those fermenters that the yeast really like uh bacteria also really like so we're trying to get our yeast to be happy but if the bacteria kind of gets in there too there's the potential for it to take off so kind of one of the scary things is there's everyone's heard of sour beers so sour beers, the way you make a sour beer is with uh, bacteria. It's a uh, lactobacillus, kind of like what a sourdough bread is. And it's very difficult to kind of keep an eye on because A, you can't see it, but B, it lives just in the ambient air. So here we don't make that many sours um, because of the process. There's a brewery uh, out in California who uh, had their uh, souring get, that's fine get that gut out. And basically, instead of having one sour beer, they had an entire brewery of sour beers and they had to run ozone through it to kind of take out and repurpose all of that. So to give you guys an idea of the cleaning, turn the camera around. This is a cleaning bucket. I mean, they, they go into the tanks and use a toothbrush to, to physically clean every little piece of the fermenters when we're done with it. Every, every piece of dirt has to be removed. You know, because it, it could, any any dirt that gets into the beer could ruin a whole batch of beer, and then we have to dump a whole batch of beer. So yeah, it's, it's fun. so so how do you like how, how do you how do you how do you determine that a a batch has had issues? Is it a taste thing? You you can taste yeah. it. Sure your your palate is re refined enough that you can taste it once I you mean, get done, and you know something's off. Sometimes you can smell it and tell it's off. Sometimes it's just, you know, you can taste it and know. Yeah. Like if I make, if we make like a New England IPA and it's sour, then that's not a good batch of beer. Uh, I've like gotcha. never done that. Yeah, we've never <laughs> done that. You know, beer has multiple off flavors. Like if you ever get a beer and you taste like a metallic taste or cardboard, that means it's gotten oxidized. Oxygen is, a, is bad for beer. Um, you know, there, there's, yeah, the green apple's a bad taste. There's yeah. uh, caramel, too much wrong, caramel yeah. in the wrong beer. Some beers kind of a rubbery, rubbery, but yeah. Also like a rubbery, buttery flavor is, is diacetyl, yeah. which is a byproduct. So you, you can taste it in the beer. But Gotcha. Um, so really using your refined palate to determine whether th something is, uh, is, is gone awry or not, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, we, we uh, taste the beer all the way through the process from start. To okay. Start. I that is one of the amazing things is how, how the taste changes from the start of fermentation all the way through to the end. Hmm. Of the, there is a significant. I got you. So based on that taste, then you can determine if something went wrong earlier in the process. Yeah. yeah. Assuming, right. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Okay. So one of our most popular beers is a Belgian Blonde. And I can tell you where it's at in the process based on how much banana flavor versus clove flavor there is and so as the yeast kind of does its thing it will re-eat some of the clove flavor and some of that banana so you know when it's nice and settled and matured and you're like ready to sell it but if there's too much banana then we know we need to wait a little bit longer yeah gotcha okay interesting That's uh, what are the terrible things about a brewery is you have to you have to taste the beer all the time uh, what are you guys what are you guys drinking right now i saw martin you had something that's hooked up it looked like orange juice almost it looks uh, I, this is a new england ipa okay so all right a, it's an east coast ipa i got you what do you got dana i got our pilsner 
Okay, gotcha. So, like those nerves, so. We, we were grateful. I'll, I'll, I'll give a shout out here to Matmo Brewing. They actually provided, we've got a headquarters in, in Greenville, North Carolina. They provided a, t a keg for our folks in Greenville, North Carolina. So we've got a viewing party in Greenville. We've got a viewing party here in Raleigh and they provided kegs at both spots. And so far from what I understand, there's thumbs up. Everybody loves it. So good job there. Uh, we Thank also have, we have at the end of this some swag. I know I saw somebody pop up and said they really wanted one of those Mad Mole hats. We've got Mad Mole hats and Mad Mole shirts here that we're going to be giving away uh, to some folks that are in attendance. And you can ping us uh, on this chat here at some point. We can give you uh, uh, information on how you can contact Mad Mole and, and get all the swag that you want. They're pretty, pretty cool looking uh, gear there, by the way. I'll also say, too, for those of you who are registered and attending, you'll be getting a special gift uh, after this is over. It's a, uh, a commemorative sign that has uh, Socktoberfest on it. This is something we're going to start doing annually, and so we look forward to doing it further, and, and hopefully for our, for our partners and our, our um, customers and friends that are out there, something you can um, hold on to and keep uh, and drink here out of it, obviously. So um, that's a good thing too. Um, so let me switch back to, as you think about cleanliness next to godliness, if you will, as you're doing your brewery and that's so important. From a cybersecurity standpoint, we take the same approach. So there's some things we need to do in our environment to make sure we're doing good cyber hygiene. And I'll be honest, uh, probably, I'm just making an assumption here for, from you guys, but for us, those companies who don't practice good cyber hygiene, those are mo the most um, exploited ways that attackers get in environments. So uh, we talk about things like passwords and having passwords that are, you know, password one, two, three, hopefully nobody on here does that, or they use the same password across multiple different services. Your Netflix password is the same as your bank password is the same as your company laptop logon password. That's not good hygiene. And an attacker can get that password and then use it to log in different places. So we think about being clean and good hygiene. That's one aspect is really uh, taking care of your passwords, they are an authentication measure. The second thing, uh, as I said, is multi-factor authentication. Your bank probably may not force it, but they should enforce it, where when you go log on to your bank website, it sends you a multi-factor code on your, on your phone. We need to do that across more things in business as well, uh, from administrative privileges to uh, logging on to your applications for your business, VPN, um, Office 365, all those things we need to enforce for MFA. So if you're a business owner on here or part of a business who's not using MFA, please reach out to us. Let us help you or let us give you some information where you can go turn that on. You need to turn that on yesterday. The other thing to remember is patching, right? So it, that is kind of the same type of environment that you think about when your tanks get dirty and you've got to clean them and get them back to a pristine state. Patching on software, computers, all those sorts of things, your phone, right? So if you're you know, uh, I, iOS just released, uh, Apple released a patch uh, just the other day for a, a vulnerability on your phones. Keeping your patching at a good level on all your devices and all your applications kind of gives you that clean baseline, uh, good cyber hygiene so that you can repel attackers that are trying to break in and steal everything they can. So we have a lot of similarities that we talked about here between brewing beer and cybersecurity. And so um, I want to make sure that we, uh, don't, we haven't missed anything here or the thing, other things that we uh, glassed over or glanced over and didn't really get to. So um, what other things do you all think about that are really important to the brewery outside of what we talked about today? So we talked about the, the ingredients, really important, the brewing process, uh, really important. Obviously, you've got, to people, you've got to have people who like beer. Uh-oh, something just blew the top off and Dana's got to be there to go fix it. What other things, Martin, are important for you all uh, to think about? So uh, hopefully Dano's all right. It looked like he just got called, uh, like I said, maybe a top, a top blew off the top of a tank or something. No, he actually, we're overflowing our HLT right now. <laughs> so he had to run to turn off the water. So. Gotcha. How about, so let me real, look real quick. That's something we haven't talked about, but I'm sure as you're dealing with things like pressure and temperature and other things, safety comes into play, right? Um, yeah, what, always. What, is, so, what does that look like for you guys? So it depends on what we're doing. Um, the HLT is kind of, we're going to brew again tomorrow. And one of the things we fill that the night before so we can preheat it. So right when we get here in the morning, we can start the brew day. Should, so what the HLT is, it's, it's um, a hot liquor tank. Yeah. So it's basically a big tank that we fill with water so we can preheat it to whatever temperature we need for the mash. 
But the problem is it takes so long to fill that we turn it on all the time to fill it. And then we forget. And this is a common thing in breweries. You're going to breweries and they'll have a sign on the wall that said last time HLT overflowed. And we have a we have one. I haven't done it for a month. Yeah. So so you know you'll forget about it and water will just come overflow out the top. <laughs> it's not it's not a huge deal um, for that, but it's something commonly. But yeah, we we have to be really careful since we are dealing with a lot of acids. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, really hot water, you know, and, and in the fermenters themselves, we're dealing with a lot of carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. So you just have to be very careful because there are a lot of accidents that can yeah. happen. So we got like, um, like I use gloves a lot just to protect my hands. So like cost is a really strong base. Um, so that one's kind of probably the most dangerous that we work with. You don't even feel it on you. So you want to just be really careful and really paying attention to that. And then whenever we go to break down the tanks and things, once the beer is out, there's still stuff that kind of gets stuck behind. So we always open the doors and hose it down. But what we always kind of teach people is when you open the manway door, you want to let it sit for a little bit and don't ever stick your head in because it's oh, a yeah. CO2 environment and you'll breathe that in and pass out immediately. So it's kind of like a you want to be really careful about what you're doing. It's not a very dangerous job as long as you're paying attention. So it's more yeah. fun than dangerous, but just pay attention. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, I, you know, if you want to go change that sign, Martin, and put last time HLT overflowed and change it for Dano's name and date. Yeah. And, well, you can do that when we get done, I guess. To make sure yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, I want to uh, pause here for just a second, see if we have any questions that anyone wants to ask. I've got some housekeeping and things. We're coming up on um, a, a little over halfway through, where, more than halfway through uh, where we were going to go. So um, any, any thoughts that you guys have or, or things that we haven't talked about that you wanted to bring out? So we talked about you know, safety being a concern or something to think about. What else? What other things uh, can you think about? Uh, that probably we should go over for folks. It, and let me ask you this, um, for, for the home brewer, right? Because we probably have some people, uh, in fact, I know we do because we had some people that say this. We've got people on the line who are home brewers. What, what kind of, it, or, or let's say somebody who's interested in getting involved in brewing at home. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, what they should do or how, how they should approach well, that? I would, I would encourage it. Anybody wants to home brew, home brew. It's, it's fun. It, that's how we got started about, you know, 10 years ago, Ola and I got a homebrew kit and we just decided to homebrew and it just turned into having a brewery. And it's, it's a lot of fun. You, you know, you, you'll make mistakes, you'll make bad beer, but you'll also make good beer and you'll learn a lot. And it's just, it's, it's fun to, to homebrew. And, you know, and, and for all the homebrewers out there, homebrewing is hard. <laughs> homebrewing is very hard. Homebrewing is way harder than, than, than what we do just because we can regulate temperatures we can control so, you know you know we can control oxygen, oxygen we can control huge. co2 homebrewing is very very hard so you know anybody and, and again it's supporting your local homebrew supply store yeah. you know, yeah. just go buy a carboy and buy a homebrew kit and just try it, it it's 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 a lot of fun you know if, if you like beer you know what do you Wine. Yeah, if not make wine or make cider or, Me. or you know, and, and again, I have to have a credit here. Check your check your law, your state laws. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, here we go. Or regulation before you do it. But in North Carolina, anybody, I think eighteen and over can homebrew. Yeah, yeah. If it's not, you can buy. It's not. I mean, California. I yeah. did that at like fifteen. Because yeah. yeah, it's not not illegal to have any of the ingredients so we would just go yeah. buy the ingredients and make it ourselves yeah and then and, you know and i want to say too i don't know if this is the right time to say it but you know if everybody support your local breweries you know if you have a brewery near you or or anywhere near you support them because it's people that have a passion for beer and you know home brewer i mean uh, craft brewing is still only what about 20 percent of the total beer, you made. Know, beer made in the u.s so go support your local breweries they're people that work hard. They're they're people that are, that are supporting local, you know. We got we just got coffee from yeah. Local you know they're, they're they're employing local yeah. local. They're you know go out to your brewery, buy some beer. You know it's it's a it's a very fun great environment. Yeah. You know, but yeah, I mean, yeah, and also if you're a home brewer, don't be afraid to go to your local brewery and talk to the brewer. 
if you have any questions, they'll be more, I guarantee you, they'll be super excited to talk to you and answer any questions you have and help you out. And because the more, the more people we have making great beer in this country, the, the better it is for everybody. Uh, so got some questions here and they're yeah. brew questions. So uh, let's, let's get to them. So uh, Brad asked, how do you add flavor to beer? So for Oktoberfest, they typically have a bread caramel flavor. How is that added? Malt. Oktoberfest is pure malt. So like for ours, we use the uh, Pilsner, Pilsen as a base, uh, Munich malt and Vienna and biscuit. And just that's it. Just malt and then a little bit of hops. But any of those kind of like ambers, stouts, that's all malt derived flavor. Your, your IPA is a more um, hop driven flavor. Okay. So, you, you know, during, during the, the boil process, the earlier you add your hops, the more bittering it adds to the beer. The later you add your hops, the more flavoring it adds to the beer and the more aroma. And then your IPA is also mostly what's called dry hop. So during the fermentation process, we will actually add, well, after the fermentation process, yeah. we'll actually add hops to the, the fermenter, which then gives it that flavor, that's, mm -hmm. that aroma. You know, your New England IPAs, which are really popular right now in, in North Carolina, um, they, they have almost have no boil hops. All the hops are added during the whirlpool process or dry hop. So that's why they're more of a fruit bomb, more of a fruit flavor. And yeah. all the different types of hops give different flavors to the beer. And then, of course, you can add certain fruits. And, yeah, I was going to say, somebody things. asked. The weirdest thing I've ever seen in a beer was peppercorn. And it was <laughs> no. awesome. Yeah, Fly, Fly Trap did it. No, the weirdest, the weirdest thing I've ever seen in a beer was at a homebrew competition. Oh, somebody God. made a, <laughs> that was a hot dog beer. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And well, they put, they put hot mean, dogs in their beer. Yeah. Um, hot dogs and beer goes together. Why not just nope. put it on one no, place? No, no, no. <laughs> Wasn't good? Oh, oh, well. uh, All right, I got it. Uh, peppercorn was good huh peppercorn's good. yeah all right i got another question for you here question from tony what is the most expensive beer you have made i had a christmas beer once that was made by a brewery that said it was very expensive to make so i'm not sure what he's uh detailing there but obviously must be some things it's more expensive yeah um, um by the glass i'd actually say excavated probably Maybe? excavated yeah or, well, some of our new englands have so much hops in them that you know, hops can be pricey depending on the type of hops. Galaxy, for that. yeah. The 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 hop type we uh, we use were called Galaxy. The, they're out of Australia and they're really hard to kind of get. Um, and so I found a really good deal on them, and they were thirty two dollars a pound as opposed to like forty five. So we added twenty two pounds of it to a beer. So that was probably the most expensive. Yeah. beer we've ever made we, we try to since we don't you know we try to keep the prices of our beer reasonable sure yeah large nine or ten dollars for a beer so you know we haven't had really i know i know there's some beers out there that are very expensive you know i saw a question pass by that i think you mind if i answer it no go ahead someone asked how do you increase the abv the abv is all based on the grain that goes into the mash time the grain you said extract the, the higher your ABV is going to be now you can add sugar to the boil so but but the more sugar you have it's, it's called gravity essentially yeah. the higher your gravity the higher your ABV is going to be in, the, in a beer so it's all based on sugar but but what does that do to the taste of the beer does it change the taste of the Depends. beer Depends. No? um like you can get we have one of our beers is 9.6 percent but you don't know there's that much alcohol in there. Whereas we've had other beers that are like 7% that get that little bit of like an alcohol burn, but it's just kind of mm, yeah. depends on how you design, what temperature you mash at, what temperature you ferment at, which yeast you use, yeah. you can kind we, of play with it. We have a Belgian dark, it's, it's a Belgian yeah. dark strong. And we add a lot of Belgian candy sugar to the boil. So that gives a very high gravity. So the ABV gets to be about what, 10, 11, 10, 11% 11 on that. Now, Alco ABV is limited by state in North sure, Carolina. Yeah. You can have is 14.9%. 14.7. 14.7, close enough. You know, some <laughs> states allow higher alcohol in beers, some states lower alcohol in beers. So it all depends on, on your So how, at what stage can you change that, right? Let's say Dano's in there one day, he, the, the 
HLT tanks going crazy, forgets about it or whatever goes on. And you got a beer that's at 16%. Is there a way you dilute that? Can you add water to it? And dilute I mean, it or what? We're not, for the most part, it all just matters on how much grain you add. So okay. add grain. So the only thing I can think of is we, when we made one of our beers, um, the computer that we use, the computer system went on the fritz and it told okay. add uh, like a hundred pounds. That wasn't, it wasn't a security attack. Have. It wasn't a security so, event, correct? It wasn't a cyber yeah, attack. Just, okay. All right. just yeah. weird programming okay. error. Good. Um, Good. But so what we did was <laughs> we have a small batch system that's only 15 gallons. So when we take the beer from the mash tun to the boil kettle, the first bit that goes through has the highest amount of sugar in it. So it's going to produce the highest amount of alcohol. So we basically diverted that to our small batch oh. And then let the rest go in. So we ended up with the exact percent yeah, alcohol and, that we wanted. But that's really, for the most part, never happened. Yeah, and for the most part, when we make our recipes, we know how much grain we're putting in there, what the gravity is going to be when, when it comes out. So another question that came, uh, that came up from Ed asked, uh, who comes up with all the unique names for your beers and does it take long? And so I think somebody said they saw a Darth, <laughs> a Darth Maul beer that you had or something. Yeah, just, Darth Maul. just don't mention that with the Disney. Just, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we we all come up with names um it's it's kind of a everybody who works in the brewery will throw names out there we have a list our, our customers come in and throw net throw names out we'll write them down and we just come out with a list of names and we try to have some reference to a mole in every single name <laughs> of our beer like our, our oktoberfest is moltoberfest you know this beer i'm drinking is called citra mole down so it's it's yeah. just that's actually one of the more fun parts of it is, is coming up with names for the beers. Is it fun? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, we, we have a lot of names we can't use. A lot of, I'm names. sure. We're, we're I'm still sure, waiting for sure. a cease and desist letter from <laughs> companies on, on what, names. Uh, so another question from Paul was, what's the most unique flavor of, of, for beer that surprised you that it tasted good to you? I think I heard peppercorn. Is yeah, that probably the what peppercorn. you think? Peppercorn. Yeah. 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 Um, how do you... Uh, how hard, here's another question from Todd. How hard is a bourbon beer to make? So bourbon yeah. beer, it, you basically, all you do is you make beer and then you'll add it to like a, it's like you go to like a, like a Buffalo Trace whiskey barrel or a bourbon barrel. And then you can add the beer barrel and then the beer itself will actually just sit for nine months, yeah. almost a year. And it'll absorb the flavoring. the flavoring from the barrel and pull that wood. So I know is it Jameson does their cask mix. Yeah. So they'll give it to a local brewery who will put a stout in it. And then once they're done with their stout, they give it back to Jameson. Jameson puts more whiskey in it. And then that whiskey pulls the stout flavor. Yeah, so now, leg legally, we're not allowed to add liquor to our beers. Right. You know, but we can put them in, but we can barrel age them. Oh, okay. Okay. So yeah, it's we, just so you the, get that on the barrels. Yeah, we... We are regulated by the federal government and by the North Carolina ABC. So there are certain things we can and cannot do. Sure. Yeah. Understood. The, the government's got to be involved there at some point. Yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Here's another question. How do you determine the alcohol content, calories per serving, et cetera? So, you know, like on when I go buy that, uh, that beer from the store, or whatever, they have the little thing that says, you know, here's how much calorie. Do you all have to do that? And, and if so, so, how do you do that? We don't have to do calories. Um, if you are doing calories, you have to run that through a mass spectrometer and it can actually like yeah. spit out the numbers. But for the most part, the alcohol content, we look at, we use uh, degrees Play-Doh, which um, is how much sugar is in the liquid that you're looking at. And it's, you can, there's calculations for how much sugar you start with, how much sugar you end with and what's in between becomes your alcohol. Oh, gosh. Okay. So it's just kind of, it's just a, an equation that we'll use. That's the scientific part of it. Yeah. I understand. All right. One more question here from, from Sean. What was your first official beer when you opened Mad Mole? Well, we, before we opened, we went on a brewing spree. We did Darth Mole, which was our, our uh, stout. We did Boston Mole Party, which is our yeah. juicy IPA. We did Maryland. We did Marilyn Monroe, which is our Belgian blonde. And then we did a we did a Kolsch that turned out to be it was good, but it wasn't great. It turned into a great beer when we decided to dump how many pounds of raspberries in it? 168. Yeah. 
decided to 168 pounds of raspberries in it and it became a raspberry colch. But those were the first four beers. We tried to open with eight beers on tap. So, you know, it was a, it was a little process to, to actually get up to speed. With, uh, cool. With All right. So we are, uh, I'm going to, uh, I think from a question standpoint, we've got most of them answered, but we will be following up with everyone via email for an on-demand link through this presentation. So uh, you, we can go back through it. If you have any questions about uh, brewing or cybersecurity, um, then just reply to us, let us know. We can get information for, from our attendees over to Madmo Brewing, or you can go to their website, right? Which is what? I don't think we've mentioned your website. What is that? Yeah, it's uh, Madmo Brewing. Madmobrewing.com. Our website is onesource.net. Uh, but by all means, you can reply back uh, to your to your presentation link that you get. We can uh, talk through that. Also, the first 100 people who registered and attended, so all you all that are still here and attended, uh, we'll be sending you this free custom beer stein. Uh, Dano and Martin, by the way, one's coming from you guys as well. Uh, so you all can put your favorite Mad Mole Brew in here and have a good time with it. We'll be sending that out to you. Um, and we'll be sending you an email letting you know you receive a sign and when it's coming. We also, while this was going on, we made it, did a random drawing. Mad Mole was gracious enough to give us some swag, some shirts and some hats, which are really cool looking. And we chose two random names who will be getting those. The lucky winners are Daniel Garcia and Stephanie Lim. So congratulations to you. We'll be sending you information about getting some Mad Mole swag out to you guys. And um, by all means, if you want some more Mad Mole swag, which I recommend you do, swing by their place, go visit Wilmington, North Carolina, a beautiful place yep. that you can come visit and go by there as well. Uh, but also you can reach out to them via the, the internet. We'd also like to offer all of our attendees a free threat assessment. So one of the ways that OneSource can provide value to your company is we do free threat assessments. We talk, go through those ideas of ingredients and recipes for your business. And we can give you information about things you should be looking at, whether that's vulnerabilities you have on your uh, devices, whether that's looking at um, your processes and procedures and making recommendations, whatever the case may be, we wanna help you. One of our goals is to protect and defend North Carolina, but we wanna do that for all businesses, uh, but most specifically in North Carolina, since that's where we're, we're headquarters and home. Once again, a tremendous thank you to Matt Mo Brewery, to Dano and Martin. Thank you all for taking time, answering questions, providing ins insights. Even while there's a big party going on there and you're making beer and everything else, you took time out to sit with us. So we really appreciate that. And we look at doing this more and more and more throughout the year. So uh, once again, thank you all. Thanks for the beer. I, like I said, there's people yeah. uh, here drinking uh -huh. beer right now. So yeah, I don't, sure. I don't know what, I don't know what kind of shape people are in that are in our offices that are drinking the Mad Mole Brew. I don't know what kind of shape people are in to watching this. Hopefully, you are uh, still sober enough that you caught all this and got some good, inf valuable information from it. And once again, if you do want more information, please reach out to us. We'd be glad to talk to you. And thanks so much for joining us. Everyone, stay safe and healthy. And uh, drink responsibly is what I'll say. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very all much right. So. Thank you. Guys. Thank you all. Thank you all, all right, thank so you. much. Thank you, Appreciate it. Have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you. All right. Thank you.